million encounters during the 12 month time frame. Roughly $13.6 billion of funding has been earmarked for border protection, including money for hiring an additional 1,300 Border Patrol agents and 1,600 new asylum officers. David Lamb, NTD News, California. As Israel Hamas war spreads into a wider conflict, the U.S. has advised Israel that postponing a ground invasion of Gaza could be helpful as the U.S. and other partners in the region try to secure the release of more than 200 hostages. Meanwhile, Hamas releases two elderly women who were among the hundreds of hostages. On Monday, Hamas released a video showing the handover of the two hostages who appeared dazed but composed. The women, along with their husbands, were snatched from their homes near the Gaza border during Hamas's October 7th rampage. Their husbands were not released. A barrage of Israel airstrikes today, leaving families buried under rubble and multiple residential buildings crushed across the Gaza Strip. Medical facilities have been closed due to the bomb damage and lack of power, and hundreds are reported killed in the past day. The Gaza Health Ministry, run by Hamas, says the attacks killed more than 700 people, including more than 300 children and close to 200 women. Israel says it launched 400 airstrikes, killing Hamas commanders and hitting militants as they were preparing to launch rockets into Israel. Tonight, the Senate voting 98 to 0 to approve President Joe Biden's nominee to lead the Federal Aviation Administration. The agency has reportedly been without a Senate-confirmed chief for 19 months. Michael Whitaker is a former FAA administrator and served as a chief operating officer of Hyundai Affiliate that is developing an air taxi. Whitaker is expected to face many challenges head-on, including a surge in close calls between planes at major airports, a shortage of air traffic controllers, and, of course, aging technology. The Senate say Whitaker will, quote, build a strong safety culture, attract new talent, and keep pace with technology transformation. A federal trial begins for a scuba dive boat captain over what's being called the deadliest maritime disaster in recent U.S. history. The tragedy happening on Labor Day in 2019, officials say by the time the scuba dive boat sank off the southern California coast after catching fire, 34 people have been killed. The National Transportation Safety Board blamed the captain, Jerry Boylan, for the tragedy, saying his failure to post a night watchman allowed the undetected fire to spread quickly, trapping 33 people and one crew member below. Boylan is now charged with one count of misconduct or neglect of ship officer. The signal, the signal count means he faces 10 years behind bars if convicted. Thank you for having me. That's great to see you again. Of course, Mary. Great to see you. Mary, you've experienced the brutality of the Iranian regime uh, firsthand from the inside. There's a lot of discussion about Iran uh, in the shadows of this Israel-Hamas conflict. What do you think? How are you assessing this situation right now? Actually, it's not just a shadow. Uh, you know, uh, in many countries, especially in the Middle East, there are a lot of terrorist groups that we call them the proxy groups of the Islamic Republic regime. Um, I can say they are the arms or the hands of the regime out out of the borders of Iran, and uh, they are the, and they are enable the regime to advance terrorist actions and um, riotous foreign policies in other countries and it appears that the regime is not directly involved and it's uh, an attempt to try not to face other countries directly and not to face international laws and um, international organizations and uh, it it lets the regime stay in a margin of safety um, but I can say um, some um, terrorist groups like Hamas, they cannot continue existing without the regime because the regime, it's been many years, not just in the recent conflict, the regime is arming them, funding them, and training them for many years. You can see um, many um, obvious signs. For example, in the videos uh, that we could see from the uh, attack of uh, Hamas to uh, in, uh, in Israel, 
we could hear easily that someone was saying calm, calm in Persian with Persian accent. It means that Iranians were involved in uh, in that attack in the hospital. That, that um, for, unfortunately, many civilian people were killed in Gaza. Uh, they claim that Israel attacked the hospital. But we can remember about the uh, shooting a premium passenger plane, that it happened by IRGC. Actually, this is a policy that they try to kill civilian people. They publish the pictures of the children who were killed to attract pity of the people from other countries. They don't want to um, have political negotiation. They just want to uh, attract your pity. So, Mary... Let, let, me, uh, let me just ask you, what do you think is Iran's end game in all of this? What are they ultimately hoping for, uh, do you think? Actually, um, because this is a, a strategy. It's not just a tactic. It's not temporary. Uh, this is a strategy that for many years the regime is following. And um, we can uh, predict, we can guess that maybe uh, the, there are, uh, we can consider a lot of reasons, but maybe the main reason is an attempt to destroy the peace agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia, because Saudi Arabia um, needs to um, react about what is going on, and um, Saudi Arabia must face Arab countries. So um, it's an important and um, um, maybe vital time to for Saudi Arabia to take a side and show uh, where Saudi Arabia is standing. But uh, regardless of that, I want to uh, ask that how the regime can advance this policy. Um, as you remember, recently um, America paid six billion uh, billion dollars to um, the regime, but we knew that. If you pay money to the regime, you would see more terrorist actions even in other countries, overseas. If you fight against Hamas today, if you fought against ISIS yesterday, tomorrow uh, another terrorist uh, group would be created by the regime. We don't want you to attack Iran. We want you to um, be inside of the people of Iran who are fighting against the regime. Yeah, Mary, the, uh, that $6 billion that was released back to Iran in the uh, hostage, um, you know, or prisoner swap, I guess you would call it, uh, has definitely come under a lot of scrutiny here in the United States. Uh, I want to ask you, before we let you go, if you could just kind of paint the picture for us inside of Iran, the situation there. Most totalitarian regimes, they have a lot of bluster. They rule, by, you know, by the iron fist. But there's also a lot of vulnerability. Uh, we see that in China as well. Uh, is the Iranian regime vulnerable? Um, definitely it is. Um, and I want to say that the main reason that proves that the regime is vulnerable is that the people of Iran are not behind the regime. The oppos Iranian opposition tried to make the regime isolated for many years. And as other countries not to negotiate, not to have any kind of relationship with the regime. And it would be a big step and uh, help us to make a revolution in Iran. Now the regime is alone in Iran and outside of, outside of Iran. So I believe that the regime is so much vulnerable. Mary Mohammadi, thank you so much for taking some time to join us. Thank you for having me. <coughs> and that is all we have for you this evening on the Capitol. Tonight, a prayer for Israel in Bartow County. Residents there gathered tonight for a community prayer vigil. Fox 5's Denise Dillon talked to those who were there about why they wanted to get together. The community prayer vigil was held outside the Bartow County Courthouse. Men, women, and children all came together. Some held flags. All were here to pray. We come to stand for the people of Israel. Bartow County residents gathered together and prayed as the violence from the Israel-Hamas war escalates. They prayed for the wounded, the hostages, and for the families of the dead, and they prayed for peace. When you start praying, things change. This community prayer for Israel was the idea of Darla Williams. She says seeing the images of the war made her feel helpless, 
Her heart told her she had to gather everyone together and pray. I just felt like that we needed to come together as a community and show our support to Israel. I think it's a beautiful expression of the allyship and solidarity and support that Israel has in here in, in Georgia. The Consul General of Israel to the Southeast U.S. says images like this community prayer are relayed to Israelis. They know they are not alone. Standing with Israel today is really about standing with humanity. It is standing for good as Israel is fighting terror, as we are fighting evil. New Beginnings Church pastor Barry Garland was in Israel just four weeks ago, days before the first attack by the armed Hamas fighters. I believe that God's got his hand on Israel and the people of Israel, all the people of Israel. This is where we need to be, to show Israel that we stand with them. As they sat outside the Bartow County Courthouse, everyone lit a candle and prayed for peace. It's a sign of peace when you just hold a candle in the dark. It's a sign of peace and unity. I asked the Consul General if she had family in Israel and if they were okay. She said physically, yes, but the whole country is affected. Everyone is in mourning. Everyone is in pain. In Bartow County, Denise Stillen. Tonight, a prayer for Israel in Bartow County. Residents there gathered tonight for a community prayer vigil. Fox 5's Denise Stillen talked to those who were there about why they wanted to get together. The community prayer vigil was held outside the Bartow County Courthouse. Men, women, and children all came together. Some held flags. All were here to pray. We come to stand for the people of Israel. Bartow County residents gathered together and prayed as the violence from the Israel-Hamas war escalates. They prayed for the wounded, the hostages, and for the families of the dead. And they prayed for peace. When you start praying, things change. This community prayer for Israel was the idea of Darla Williams. She says seeing the images of the war made her feel helpless. Her heart told her she had to gather everyone together and pray. I just felt like that we needed to come together as a community and show our support to Israel. I think it's a beautiful expression of the allyship and solidarity and support that Israel has in here in, in Georgia. The Consul General of Israel to the Southeast U.S. says images like this community prayer are relayed to Israelis. They know they are not alone. Standing with Israel today is really about standing with humanity. It is standing for good as Israel is fighting terror, as we are fighting evil. New Beginnings Church pastor Barry Garland was in Israel just four weeks ago, days before the first attack by the armed Hamas fighters. I believe that God's got his hand on Israel and the people of Israel, all the people of Israel. This is where we need to be, to show Israel that we stand with them. As they sat outside the Bartow County Courthouse, everyone lit a candle and prayed for peace. It's a sign of peace when you just hold a candle in the dark. It's a sign of peace and unity. I asked the Consul General if she had family in Israel and if they were okay. She said physically, yes, but the whole country is affected. Everyone is in mourning. Everyone is in pain. In Bartow County, Denise Stillen. Republicans chose Minnesota Congressman Tom Emmer as their speaker. Emmer dropping his bid this evening. This following a scathing social media post by former President Donald Trump, who called Emmer a rhino, meaning Republican in name only. Newsnet's David Aid has more from Washington. Today marks three weeks without a Speaker of the House and with Republicans basically starting back at ground zero, according to the House Freedom Caucus, lawmakers are starting to worry how much longer the House is going to be paralyzed. Speaker or no Speaker, we're going we to work without the Speaker on this today. Milwaukee Democratic Congresswoman Gwen Moore standing with advocates of a bill that would extend the earned income tax credit to unpaid caregivers like mothers and military wives caring for disabled veterans. You know, this is uncivilized the way we treat uh, poor people in this country. 
after not passing the last Congress. This legislation was reintroduced this year and only has 22 Democratic co-sponsors. Even if we had a speaker, we know that we have to work hard on this bill. So as House Republicans went through several rounds of internal voting before settling on Congressman Tom Emmer as their speaker designate, who then dropped out about four hours later, advocates for Moore's legislation fanned out across Capitol Hill on Tuesday. We've got about five teams, and each team is going to be hitting up <laughs> various people on both the House and the Senate side. So we have a lot of we have a lot of work to do, trying to cut through Capitol Hill's uncertainty and hoping to make their voices and stories heard by Democrats and Republicans. We are look, we're volunteers. Did nobody fund us to get here? <laughs> you know, we put our little pennies together and got impoverished people here. Even if the House does vote in a new speaker this week, the chance of a government shutdown waits just around the corner. The government funding legislation that former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy teamed up with Democrats to pass, which ultimately led to him being pushed out, expires on November 17th. In Washington, I'm David Aid for Newsnet. Turning to New York, where Michael Cohen, Donald Trump's fixer turned foe, taking the stand in the former president's civil fraud trial. Cohen's testimony delayed from last week by an unspecified health issue. He'll testify in Attorney General Letitia James's case, alleging Trump and his company duped banks and insurers by overvaluing his wealth. Cohen testified that he was tasked by Trump to increase the total value of assets based upon a number that Trump selected. When asked what that number was, Cohen replied, whatever number Trump told us to. Trump dismissed Cohen's account outside the court as the words of a proven liar. Earlier today, attorney Jenna Ellis pleads guilty to a felony charge over efforts to overturn Donald Trump's 2020 election loss in Georgia. Ellis was a vocal part of Trump's re-election campaign in the last presidential cycle and was charged alongside the former president and 17 others with violating the state's anti-racketeering law. Ellis faced counts of violating Man, Georgia's Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act, known as RICO, and soliciting the violation of oath by a public officer of both our felonies. Let's take a look at the Dow numbers today. Here with more is the streets JD Durkin from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I'm J.D. Durkin reporting from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Stocks were in the green to close out the today's session. The Dow good. closing up over 200 points. The Nasdaq closed up almost a full percent, while the S&P 500 closed seven-tenths of a percent higher. It's always a good feeling when there's green on the big board. Investors are keeping a close watch on the crypto market today after Bitcoin surpassed $35,000. It was crypto's largest single-day jump in over a year. And Wall Street is also reacting to a bunch of strong earnings reports, Coca-Cola, Spotify, General Motors, they all reported better than expected results today. Investors are awaiting results as well from Google parent company Alphabet as well as Microsoft later on this evening. Other big tech names like Amazon and Meta are on deck for later this week. Speaking of Meta, the social media officials believe that a man and a woman helped the inmates get away. Ja'Kalen Williams was arrested this morning on accusations that he had stolen a Dodge Challenger from Enterprise Rental Car back on October the 9th. Investigators say that a week later the vehicle was used as a getaway car. Makia Williams was arrested yesterday. The escaped inmates are still on the run. There's a $73,000 reward for their capture. Atlanta police are searching for at least two gunmen who opened fire on a Southwest Atlanta home and killed a grandmother. The woman was holding her two-month-old grandchild when she was shot. Relatives say the victim was 57-year-old Andrea Brown. Neighbors heard the multiple gunshots around 5 this morning on Highview Road off Beecher Road in southwest Atlanta. Police say there were several occupants inside the house, including children. They were shooting from the street into the house, uh, indiscriminately into the house, and on, uh, this woman uh, was shot while she was in her room. Police say the house was targeted, but the bullets were intended for someone else. New tonight at 11, a domestic dispute ends with a shooting in northwest Atlanta. Officers were called to James P. Brawley Drive about 1.30 this afternoon after reports a man had been shot. Investigators say that that man and a woman got into a domestic dispute, and that's when another man pulled out a gun and shot the victim. 
Police are investigating. A new mother is shot three times during an attempted murder-suicide. The gunman was her baby's father. It happened in August at a Morrow apartment. Jalen Morris's mother said her daughter was in an abusive relationship with her baby's father. Jalen's ex-boyfriend came over to visit with the baby when things escalated. Her ex-boyfriend shot her three times from close range, twice in the face and once in the back. Then he shot and killed himself. Jalen's mother says the only solace is that he is the one who's dead. It's hard because he did take his own life. And I wish I could say that I'm happy about that. I mean, I'm happy that she'll never have to deal with him again. The only person that's paying a consequence is our daughter. Doctors say it's not likely Jalen will ever walk again. Her family is taking care of her son and rebuilding to accommodate her wheelchair as she continues to recover. Overcrowding at the troubled Fulton County Jail has improved slightly. Sheriff Patrick Labatt says that the decrease is due to people moving through the system and inmate transfers. The Sheriff's Office transferred about 400 inmates to the Atlanta City Detention Center. More went to facilities in Cobb, Oconee, Forsyth Counties, and in other jail locations. The sheriff says he plans to move people to local facilities first, then look at other long-term options likely within the state. Another former ally to former President Trump flips in the... You're the city councilman in Glendale. Can you tell us what, what happened from your perspective? Sure. Let me give you a little background about Glendale first so we understand about the city. It's a city of about 200,000, just north of Los Angeles. Uh, we have our own school district, and we have been known for having a very good school district uh, in the past. The population of Glendale has about 40% uh, of Armenian uh, ethnicity uh, individuals. And Armenian, but a wide range of Armenian, Armenians from Iran, Armenians from the Middle East, Armenians from Russia, from Armenia, from all over. And, uh, of course, they have commonalities. We have the Armenian language, the Armenian uh, religion, uh, and they're all uh, dedicated, these parents, to raising their children in the very best way possible. Make no mistake about that. They are committed and dedicated parents who will make almost any sacrifice that they have to for their children's good. And that's just a historical or a cultural thing that Armenians have done. Other other ethnicities also do the same, but in Glendale, that's what that's what we see. So, it probably started during the pandemic when some parents realized that the <laughs> children were being presented with this is on their little Zoom classes they were getting uh, was not appropriate, inappropriate sex education. Teachers that wanted to explain. Uh, the proper way for oral sex between wow. two members of the same uh, wow. sex. Um, it went even further. And even So that even exists, okay. Yes, definitely. They got to the point where they were approaching the children and informing them that if you're not sure that you are a boy or a girl, don't worry. We can help you change if that's what you want. And... We don't even have to tell your parents about it. And they can offer, they call it gender affirming care, which is counseling, which is uh, advice, which is a uh, commencement of mm. medical procedures, uh, hormonal procedures, um, and, and the rest, without letting the parents know. Uh, we started requesting public records to get more information because it's like we had scratched the surface. We knew there was a lot more happening behind closed doors. And I feel like the pandemic was the perfect excuse while the doors were shut and parents were left out. Literally, the doors were shut in our face. We couldn't even take a step on campus. A lot of things were pushed into the classrooms that parents would have objected to. And Armenian parents, as well as some other parents, they would die for their kids. Let me tell you, there's, there's nothing more important uh, to an Armenian family 
uh, than, than family. I mean, Armenians have been around for thousands of years, and they've been conquered by the Persians, by the Mongols, by the Turks. Turks. And the only thing that's kept them together during all that adversity is their uh, culture, their language, uh, their religion for the last uh, 2,000 years. Before that, they didn't have the religion issue because there was no Christianity, uh, and their culture. And that's what kept them together. And these, it's ingrained in the Armenia psyche, Armenian psyche that their kids are the most important thing for them. So these parents would speak amongst themselves and complain, and they decided to get together and unite and present their objections to the Glendale Unified School District Board of Education. And that Board of Education meets uh, generally about once a week. We were just trying to attend a board meeting, and then we posted it on um, multiple parents, posted it on their social medias, on their Facebooks, and then we see that all these people outside of Glendale are posting to come and protest against us. And who did they invite? But they invited Antifa. Antifa has never been in Glendale before, uh, except on June 6th they did. And on that June 6th, June 6th uh, school board meeting, the two sides were at the same place at the same time. And there were protests against what the school board was doing. And on the other side, there were protests against the parents. It was scary at one point because it felt like the two groups were going to, like, you know, clash together. And I never, being at all these board meetings, have I ever seen barricades be pulled up and there's so much police presence that the city of Glendale had to tap into their outside resources and have Pasadena Police Department join, the Monrovia Police Department join. They had neighboring cities coming in trying to basically control the crowd. So we went there to, you know, be parents at, at a board meeting and we were faced with people with double, triple masks and bandanas and umbrellas and, and you know, they like literally just crashed and, and it was the point where, you know, the police weren't able to barricade, the, you know, separate the, the two groups. Um, there was this lady with a microphone. I remember I, I like turned around, I was just like so shocked. She's screaming at us saying, Christian fascists go away. And I was like, lady, you don't even live here. I live in Glendale. Tomorrow you'll be gone. My kid will still wake up and go to school here in the school district in Glendale. Who are you to come here and tell me to go away? You need to go away. You have no business being here, you know? Um, so that's what we were faced with. They, they um, gathered their resources. They thought, okay, there's uh, too many conservatives here in Glendale, so we need to try to outnumber them. Uh, wow. sex and informing them that if you're not sure that you are a boy or a girl don't worry we can help you change if that's what you want and we don't even have to tell your parents about it uh, we started requesting public records to get more information because it's like we had scratched the surface. We knew there was a lot more happening behind closed doors. We were just trying to attend a board meeting and then we posted it on um, multiple parents, posted it on their social medias, on their Facebooks. And then we see that all these people outside of Glendale are posting to come and protest against us. And who did they invite? But they invited Antifa. And there's so much police presence that the city of Glendale had to tap into their outside resources and have Pasadena Police Department join, the Monrovia Police Department join. They had neighboring cities coming in trying to basically control the crowd. And Armenian parents, as well as some other parents, they would die for their kids, let me tell you. On today's California Insider, we dive into LA's political store with Aaron.